Singer-songwriter Gail Travers is tired of her bird of passage life. Things need to change soon. For as long as she could remember, she's always wanted to be a singer. An opportunity, once in a lifetime shot, had finally presented itself when her best friend, Layla, had pointed her towards the news that iHeartRadio is poaching young, talented, independent singers for this year's Christmas Eve special. At the age of 25, she feels like she should have been way past her pub singing days. She wants to make real music of her own. As she makes her way through the pub's kitchen entrance for another day's work, Mr. Taylor, the owner, informs her that she's late. Her gig was up 20 minutes ago. She apologizes to him, and Mr. Taylor asks her to make it to the stage in real time. He also instructs her to put on one of his Christmas light garlands. For him, Christmas at pub starts a day after Thanksgiving. Layla joins them in the kitchen. Their plan is in place. Layla had proposed that Gail should record her performance on camera tonight. She will then send that video over to iHeartRadio. She asks Gail if she's ready for it. They head over to the stage, and Layla sets up Gail's phone on a stand to record. Once the ring light is in place, she cues Gail to start. Gail introduces herself as a 25-year-old singer, who is from Miami, Florida, but has never belonged to any one place in particular. She hits the notes for indie singer Everly's popular song, For the Crowd. Gail has not even been so far as the first few lines, when Mr. Taylor spots what is actually happening. He walks over to the stage and reminds Gail, in no uncertain terms, that the pub entertains requests from the crowd only. Gail's performance is cut short, and she quickly switches to singing one request from the client seated there, Pat Benatar's Shadows of the Night. Later that night, as Layla calculates their tips from the night's gig, Gail expresses to her that at least they tried to give a shot to recording her performance. Maybe it isn't meant to be, but Layla isn't convinced. She reminds Gail that merely five artists are to be picked for the opening acts at iHeartRadio's Christmas Eve special, not to mention the offered spot on a tour and a three-year contract. There was no denying that it would have been professional for her to be singing on that pub stage, but Layla is sure Gail will make it look good from anywhere. She is not going to let Gail give it up just yet. Gail takes the Christmas lights garland off her neck, and Layla is stricken by an idea. Layla decorates the interior of Gail's decrepit van with the garlands, so that the inside looks like a glittering Christmas tree. Gail is impressed. Layla sets up the phone and the ring light, and cues Gail to start singing. Once the performance is recorded, Layla sits down to edit the rough edges and make it presentable. She remarks that seeing how incredible Gail is, she should seriously consider writing her own songs. Gail is not confident she could write something soulful like that. She has tried in the past a few times. They just never felt inspired. Leela urges her to let inspiration find her. Gail sends off the brushed up video to iHeartRadio. The chances of her getting picked were slim to none. It was five people out of hundreds of thousands. She wasn't that incredible singer, no matter what Layla believes. But Layla is optimistic. If this doesn't happen, then someone somewhere will give her the chance that she deserves. The right place at the right time is bound to happen, with her running all over the continental US in that tin can of hers. She meant Jewel. Jewel is Gail's princess. Her pride and joy. He decrepit van. Or Gail can simply set roots in Tampa and let go of the van life. Which, of course, is difficult for Gail to fathom, for she feels that the open roads call her name. As Layla leaves, Gail pulls out her diary where she keeps a list of all the opportunities that life has thrown her way. I Heart Radio was number one for December, but it's time to strike it off. The next morning, Gail shares on Instagram her one-year anniversary with Jewel. She's been living and breathing in it for a whole year, which if she was honest, seemed a challenging task at the beginning. While she was updating her story on Instagram, her phone chimes with a notification. She's been selected for the iHeartRadio event. Shrieking with joy, Gail jumps out the back of the Van Sands clothes, clad in just a towel. She immediately calls Layla, telling her the unbelievable news that she's made it. Well, unbelievable for Gail. Layla had always been telling her so. So, Gail sets off on the road with explicit instructions from Layla to text her every single stop she makes on the way. Gail is exhilarated to be back on the road. She shares as much with her Insta story, telling her followers that she'll be hitting up open mic nights all the way from Florida to Le. It'll be just like one long rehearsal for opening iHeartRadio's Christmas Eve special, with some of the top artists in the country. Along the way, she reminisces about how she had been homeless for quite a while, before she bought her darling van, Jewel. She had no idea where her voice was going to take her. And now, she is about to make her debut on national TV. She owes it all to her fans and followers. She beseeches them to aid her along this road as well, as she needs gas money. Gail jaunts through Alabama, Louisiana and then over to Oklahoma, performing at every pub and cafe that offers open mic nights, and collects a sum in the process. One morning while she's still in Oklahoma, Gail starts her live feed for Instagram, something that has become a norm on this road trip. She is asking viewers to suggest a good place to get coffee, because her coffee machine has broken. 
She also asks them to recommend any good food spots along Santa Fe. On the agenda for today is to set up the details for another gig. So Gail turns her engine on, ready to start her day. A couple hours down the road, she receives a call from iHeartRadio with regards to how her preparations were coming along for the Christmas Eve special. Gail tells the representative, M.S. Walker, that she is very excited to get this opportunity. When Walker asks about her music, Gail tells her that she loves to play the oldies, anything soulful, and she can spin acoustics. But Walker has other ideas. She tells Gail that the station wants her to prepare an original. Gail is flabbergasted. She has never successfully written an original song. She hasn't written anything that she'd like to sing. This was a fast turnaround. Walker offers to pull her out, if it's not doable for her. But for Gail, that won't do either. She tells her that she's going to get an original song ready in two weeks. The anxiety of the situation diverts Gail's attention from the road, as she tries to take deep calming breaths. When she looks up to the road next, there's a llama staring at her, standing in the middle of the road, directly before her rapidly moving vehicle. With a scream, Gail steers the van off to the other side of the road. She crashes on the fence there. She gets off the van, as smoke starts to swell in the pair. The phone screen is shattered and won't open. Someone touches her, asking if she is okay. Did she get hurt? She is fine. But the same could not be said about the poor llama. It is actually an alpaca. The woman coming to her rescue tells her that. Apparently, Eddie the alpaca likes to pretend that he has passed away. The woman gives some snacks in Gail's hand, and asks her to offer those to Eddie, to test the theory. At Gail's offered snacks, Eddie stands right up, like he was not just then feigning eternal rest. The woman takes Eddie's lead in hand, reassuring Gail that he is fine. But her van, on the other hand, is not good to go. She inquires about where Gail is headed. Upon learning Gail's route to Santa Fe and then La, the woman tells her that she won't be able to take her that far, but she can tow Gail's van to her shop in town. Gail is very grateful for all the help she offers. The woman then introduces herself as Savannah, but people around town call her Van. A woman named Van is going to fix Gail Van. Gail asks Van what place they were in. So, she then welcomes her quite flamboyantly to Harmony Springs, Oklahoma. They reach Van's auto shop. It is a handsomely sized space, which seemed to welcome all kinds of vehicles, regardless of the make or age. Two walls to the far north are covered in all sorts of mechanical tools that Gail could identify, from hammers and screwdrivers, to pry bars, wrenches, pliers, etc. As Gail walks past the wall, she asks Van if she could get a ride to the nearest Verizon store. Van scoffs at the thought. There was no Verizon store anywhere near Harmony Springs Horizon. The next best option they had here was the nearest gas station that sells walkie-talkies, some 50 miles from Van's shop. Gail has no use for walkie-talkies, she asks Van if she would lend her phone to her instead. She needs to update her Insta story. Readily, Van hands her phone down to Gail. It was ancient. The good old Nokia 3310 feature phone. Van starts to look over the damage to Gail's vehicle. She finds Gail's guitar amongst the wreck, and asks Gail if she plays one. But the guitar is now broken. This is turning worse and worse by the minute, Gail thinks, as Van introduces her to her son Jeremy, who has just rolled out from underneath Gail's van. Jeremy, as Van tells Gail, is the best mechanic in Oklahoma, and he is going to fix Gail's van in no time. Jeremy tells Gail that the damage wasn't too bad, but for a vehicle as old as that one, it will take some time to find and bring all the required parts to Harmony. Two weeks at least, depending on how fast they could get here. Gail does not have two weeks. She needs to report to Le by the 24th of December. Then, there's also the matter of covering the costs for the repair. Jeremy tells her that she's looking at about $2,600, give or take. At the moment, all Gail has in the name of savings, checkings money, is 540. Gail could not afford to spend that money on her van. It is all she has. Van proposes an idea then. Since Gail could play a guitar, she can perform at Gus's tonight. She instructs Jeremy to take her to Gus's bar. That would allow her an opportunity to earn some fast cash. To say that Jeremy was not eager to leave the workshop to take Gail to Gus's would be an understatement. But Van forces him to wash up and leave, anyhow. Once they are on the road, Gail asks Jeremy if she could borrow his phone. He hands her a similar feature phone. Seems like no one in this town has ever heard of a smartphone. While he drives, Jeremy fills Gail in about the pass the hat night at Gus's, which means best performance gets the pot that evening. The pot's not going to be 2,000 bucks, but it'll be a start for her. The bar is a cozy space decorated to the brim with Christmas lights and props. In the far corner there's a stage, and a woman clad in bright pink boa is performing wild karaoke. The two of them sit at the bar, and Jeremy orders two shots at Gail's request. Scarlett comes over to greet Jeremy then, asking him who the newcomer was. Jeremy introduces Scarlett to the famous Gail Travers. Gail wasn't famous, yet. Gail's inquires Scarlett if she is too late to sign up for the night. Scarlett assures her that they may be able to squeeze her in. As Rachel ends her karaoke performance, she shimmers off the stage with a flagrant wave of her pink boa. It is Gail's turn next. She downs her shot and steps on stage, correcting the DJ that her name was not Gladys Travelers, as Scarlett has told him just then. 
The DJ asks her what song she is going to sing along to. Gail asks the audience if anyone is willing to pitch in some extra cash for her to perform a shuffle. An excited gasp waves through the crowd. The DJ spins the dial that lands on Wayfaring Stranger. Gail knows that song really well. And if it was good enough for Johnny Cash, it'll be good enough for Gail as well. She picks up a forlorn guitar that someone's left by the side of the stage and starts to hit the chords herself. The performance is a hit as everyone applauds the place to an ear-splitting echo. Gail steps off the stage with a flourish. The DJ urges people to get their votes started so they can decide upon who gets to take home the prize money. The amateur performances stood no chance against Gail's. She wins the night plane and square. Gail passes the prize money to Jeremy and asks him to start the repairs. It has been a long day and Gail could use some sleep by then. She decides to leave the bar. Jeremy follows her in his truck. She has no place to go, so he isn't sure where exactly she is walking, all by herself. Gail tells him she is going to sleep in her van, like she always does. Considering the fact that the van was still at the workshop, which would have been locked up by now, Jeremy offers to drive her back there. Once cozy inside her van, Gail sits by her bed and pulls out her notebook. She needs to write an original song. If only it were that simple. The next morning, Gail is jolted from her sleep by Savannah working underneath the van. She jumps out of the back to find Savannah rolling from underneath and Jeremy with two cups of coffee. Savannah rebuffs Jeremy for letting Gail sleep in a vehicle that was under maintenance. She tells Gail she will no longer be sleeping like that. As Jeremy hands Gail the coffee that he's brought for her, he notices her shivering, clad only in a nightshirt as she was. He takes off his puffer jacket and places it around Gail's shoulders. Gail thanks him for the chivalry. She spots the sheriff's badge on Jeremy's jacket and asks him what it was for. Jeremy was filling in for the sheriff for a couple weeks as he was off on a hunting trip. Gail has a plan. She's going to get a decent paying job while Jeremy could work on the van. Once she's made two grand, she'll pay him and be on her way. She then asks him to refer her to a job in that town. Diner, post office or phone operator, anything. Jeremy tells her that with the minimum wage there being $7, she will be making a mere 300 in the next two weeks. He then tells Gail his own plan. Staring at the lone inflatable Santa that stands at the entrance to Harmony Springs Middle School, Gail asks Jeremy what they were doing there. They enter the corridor and are met with an extremely panicked Sarah. She is looking for Jeremy and now having found him, complains about something chaotic happening in the room that she keeps pointing towards. Her breaths are shallow and rapid. Gail commands her attention, she helps her exercise her breathing pattern. Once calmed, Sarah embraces Gail gratefully. She asks if Gail was their new music teacher. Jeremy replies in affirmative. The two of them steer Gail towards the music room, which is in complete turmoil. The drummer is banging all sorts of electric notes. The keyboard player is frantically running his fingers up and down the keys with no regards to rhythm, and the flute player is shrill and choppy. Sarah whistles loudly and the room falls into silence. Sarah introduces Gail as their new music teacher. Mr. Cosby, the principal, offers her the job. He heard her sing last night at Gus's bar. He feels that Gail is more than qualified for this job, which has been another notch in Jeremy's belt up until that moment. Jeremy admits that he's been, quite unsuccessfully, trying to teach those kids for the past two weeks. No one in town has been able to accomplish this feat. With their performance at the Christmas Gala in just two weeks, if Gail teaches them, they might stand a chance to win. And if they do, Mr. Cosby promises Gail to cover up her repair expenses as compensation and give her a third of the prize money. Gail is skeptical. On one hand she could not afford to let Mr. Cosby's offer go down, she needs to get her van fixed up and reach La by Christmas Eve. On the other hand, she does not know the first thing about Christmas galas. Gail shakes Cosby's hand on the deal. As Sarah shows Gail around the music room, Principal Cosby pulls Jeremy to the side. He tells Jeremy that the school has decided to end the music program after this year's gala. Back in the classroom, once everyone is seated, Gail asks each of them to go around telling their names, musical interests, and favorite Christmas tradition. Sarah Hughes goes first. She wanted to be an opera singer and likes leaving food for Santa's reindeer on Christmas Eve. Jeff and Johnny, a set of twins, like to wrap and set traps in their chimney to catch Santa. Benjamin Donovan likes to wear matching PJs with his mom and dad while decorating the Christmas tree. He can play the oboe. Gail asks them if playing instruments was compulsory for all of them because she herself doesn't know how to play them all. She wasn't a real music teacher. The children then turn the tables on her and ask what her musical interests and favorite Christmas tradition are. She didn't have any traditions. She never struck around in one place to make that happen. She then demonstrates her musical skills by playing a Christmas song on the piano. The school bell goes off and the kids leave the music room, excited at the prospect of winning the gala now that they have a real musician to teach them. Gail sits with her head propped against her hand, playing idle notes on the piano, when a sudden movement from behind the Christmas tree startles her. It was a child, another one from the class. She tells Gail she gets shy before strangers and loud noises. Her name is Rosemary. When Gail leaves the school premises, she finds a bike waiting for her outside. It has a note from Savannah, telling her to make use of it, while her wheels are repaired. 
Gale stops by the workshop, where Jeremy is busy pulling Gale's van into pieces. He tells Gale that if she can no longer sleep in her home, she is welcome to make use of the studio owned by his parents. It isn't much, but it has four walls and a roof. So, Jeremy drives Gale to the studio. They indulge in a small talk along the way, and Gale tells Jeremy to take good care of Jewel, since she is the only home that she's ever had. Jeremy assures her that Jewel will be in good hands. He then proceeds to extend his apology. He had been pretty mean to Gale when she first showed up at the workshop. It wasn't anything that she did, just that any mention of big cities leaves a bad taste in his mouth. He proposes to take her to dinner right then. Miss Oklahoma Barbecue is a fancy rustic joint owned by Rachel, the karaoke singer. She welcomes them warmly, telling Gail that her boys, Jeff and Johnny, have been raving about her since. Later that night, Jeremy and Gail get to the studio. It was a cozy albeit messy space, giving off very warm homey vibes. They set about decluttering and make it appear even homier. Jeremy tells Gail that Mr. Cosby had asked him to convey the message that Gail's class starts at 8am tomorrow morning. Gail groans, 8am for two weeks, when will she ever find time to write her song? Early next morning, Gail sits in an empty music room, futilely trying to write her song. That day, Gail teaches them how to focus on the instrument that they already have, their voice. She makes them close their eyes and place their hands on their hearts. This is from where they'll sing. She then asks them to set an intention about how they want to feel when they sing. And then, she tells them to stretch their arms in front of them and release it into the universe. Today, they are going to try singing a simple note. Gail makes them go around hitting note, one after another. Rosemary's is the best amongst the five of them. After Sarah's high-pitched notes, Gail divulges to them that she needs to write her own song for an important event. It would be nice if they all pitched in to write it together. That way, they can sing their own song at the gala. That night, Gail sits writing her lyrics when Jeremy visits her, saying that she never came to visit Jewel at the shop today. Gail tells him she is trying to write down some lyrics, as she has two songs to write now. One for the Christmas gala, and the other the iHeart Radio's original. Jeremy hands her a send-back box that he's brought. It was a box that Gail could send her broken phone into via mail, and then that company would mail her a brand new one, in return. He tells her that he could mail it that night, if she'd just put her phone in. As he stands to leave, Jeremy offers to take her out to dinner, if she could squeeze in a break from writing. Jeremy brings Rachel's barbecue sandwich over to his construction site, a house that he is building for his parents. They sit down for a picnic, outside on the makeshift porch. Jeremy then urges Gail to tell him about her family. Gail never knew her parents and never had a house. She grew up in foster care from the day she was born. It wasn't all bad. One of her many foster dads, a stand-up guy, he had taught her how to ground herself and use the nervous butterflies to find her voice. He moved to Canada for a business opportunity, and since foster kids can't leave the country, Gail had to say goodbye. Gail reverts the question back to Jeremy and remarks that his childhood here in Harmony Springs must have been great. Jeremy did have a pretty good childhood. They had the biggest house uphill, nothing but green for miles. But they couldn't stay up there after his brother Parker passed away. Building the music program at Harmony Springs Middle School was the least he could do. Parker was the star of the music program, basically starting it. His voice was best, and Jeremy pushed him too far in his pursuit. One night, they were at a party, and Parker had a gig early the next morning. He was exhausted and wanted to leave, and Jeremy just passed him his car keys. He must have fallen asleep while driving, because he hit a curb and crashed. They never saw him again. All because Jeremy couldn't leave the party before Coldplay got there. He wanted to take a picture with them to impress some girl he didn't even know. Gail understands then why he hates smartphones so much and why the idea of posting constantly on social media was nauseating for him. Jeremy doesn't agree with Gail's insight. Posting online is a priority for her career. But he likes the laid-back, unplugged Gail much better. He leans in for a sweet kiss. The days mingle into a joint harmonious routine. Gail teaches the kids with multiple practical exercises, and Jeremy gets the house done for his parents. Gail's lyrics have finally started to find their muse, as she and Jeremy grow closer. One night, as Gail sits at dinner in Jeremy's parents' trailer, Savannah expresses how sad she is about Gail having to leave for less so soon. Jeremy's dad asks Gail what will happen after her gig. Gail has spent her whole life on the road, and this gig will end with another road trip one that hopefully leads her to stardom. After Gail leaves, the kids will go back to Jeremy's custody, but this time, he won't have to work on them. Gail has done all the hard work for him. He will just need to get them up on the stage. She's going to miss them all so much. Later that night at her studio, Gail sits finishing up her song, when she gets an unexpected visitor, Scarlett. She's there to bid her farewell to Gail. While at it, she asks if Gail had planned something, as a parting gesture for Jeremy. He's sensitive about these things. Gail hadn't had the time to even think about it. 
Scarlett offers to tidy up the studio space with Gail. This would mean something to him, as he's been wanting to put this place together for some time. Scarlett starts unpacking painting and photo frames from a box that Jeremy had specifically told Gail to steer clear off. When Jeremy shows up at her door later that night, the look of shock on his face shows anything but joy. Gail's confused. She hasn't expected this reaction. She tries to explain why she did it, but Jeremy isn't listening. He turns on his heels and barges out the door. In her quest to find Jeremy, Gail comes to Savannah's trailer. With panicked breaths, she relays to Van what had happened. Savannah is mildly surprised by Gail's news. That studio had belonged to Parker since he was always writing there. Maybe that's why Gail has had such great luck writing her song there. Or maybe it was Jeremy who inspired her. In any event, it must have been excruciating to watch the studio set up the way it was when Parker was still alive. Van divulges to Gail how while Savannah and Abe grieved Parker, Jeremy had isolated and thrown himself in work. He's come up for air for the first time in years. He is cooking again and playing music while working. There's a light in his eyes again. All since she came here, Savannah finds Jeremy working on Jewel. She has brought along a cup of tea as an icebreaker. They all miss Parker. Jeremy has been drowning for so long that he couldn't even feel it when he pulled the people closest to him into the undertow. Jeremy bangs a fist against Jewel's side. He shouldn't have snapped at Gail. The next morning, Gail unpacks her new phone, which she had received two days ago. She had countless unread notifications, most of which were texts from Layla. An email from iHeartRadio says they wanted a recording of her original. Though she responds to Layla's texts, Gail couldn't bring herself to post an update on Instagram. She's late for class that day. She walks in, apologizing profusely. Little does she know, an apology is waiting in there for her. The students perform an I'm sorry chorus on Jeremy's behalf, who stands to the side, mouthing the words of apology to Gail. The six of them then present her with parting gifts. Benjamin gives her a Christmas sweater. Sarah and Rosemary gift her back her restored guitar, while Jeff and Johnny bring her a vase full of flowers. Lastly, Jeremy presents her with her fixed-up tip box. Moved by the suite of gestures, Gail leans over for a tender kiss. These kids have already won in her eyes. It does not matter if they win at the gala. Jeremy takes Gail, close-eyed, to the garage, where he reveals Jewel's refurbished state. He helps her record her music video for. This is Christmas. Jeremy finds it mesmerizing. She pulls him in her arms, and they share intimate moments together. The next morning, when Jeremy wakes up in Gail's bed, he accidentally knocks over her notebook. It falls open on a pros and cons list that Gail has made, about whether she should stay or leave Harmony Springs. Jeremy was her major reason for staying. He steps out of the van, trying to catch a breath. While he's making coffee for the day, he is visited by Scarlett. She is there to apologize for all that had happened. She had always hoped that they'd end up together. She leans in and kisses his cheek. Gail has been watching this interlude from afar. How could she have been this stupid? When Jeremy comes to her after Scarlett leaves, Gail confronts him about the ordeal. Was she just some fling to make Scarlett jealous? Jeremy cannot be the reason for Gail giving her dreams up. She shouldn't be held back. He doesn't want her. Heartbroken, Gail leaves for La. When she gets to iHeartMedia's building, it's both exactly like she imagined, and nothing like she had wanted. Although she's warmly welcomed, the executives there seem to be hell-bent on transforming Gail into a whole different person. They want to change her hair, the way she dresses, the type of guitar she plays, and the name of her song. Even her own name isn't safe from their scrutiny. Overwhelmed by this spin of events, Gail runs off stage. She excuses herself for a short break and locks herself in the powder room. There, she can only think of one person to call. Savannah. Savannah catches the tremor in Gail's voice and asks if she is okay. She's always asking her that. Gail relays to her how frenzied things are here, and how she feels this will alter her authenticity. Savannah advises her to remember why she'd always wanted to sing. She tells her that she will always have a home in Harmony Springs, with them. She can always come back, and rely on them being there for her. As Gail steps out of the cubicle, one of her co-hosts, Amy, is waiting for her outside. Amy advises Gail to not let the demands of the studio overwhelm her. She should stick to the best version of herself. And while she's at it, she offers to fly Gail to Harmony Springs for the gala. Girls need to stick together, after all. Savannah receives another call while working before Christmas Eve. It is Amy Brown from iHeartRadio, and she wants Savannah to do something for her. That night, Gail surprises the students by visiting them offstage for a quick confidence boost. She would never have missed the gala. Jeremy stops by. Gail confronts him about the whole, if you love her, let her go, idea. Jeremy never wanted to hold her back, but it is Gail's choice in the end. And she chooses to stay. She chooses to teach the music program at Harmony Springs. She chooses to write songs with her muse right by her side, in a place that feels home. The gala performance runs smoothly under Sarah's organized stage management. Rosemary's sweet voice wins hearts in the audience. Gail could not have been prouder. The winner of the 100th annual Henderson County Christmas Gala is Harmony Springs. As the crowd cheers and applauds in celebration, Savannah is on another mission. With Sarah's help, she sets up iHeart live streaming on FaceTime for Gail. Running back to the center stage, Sarah then asks their music teacher to sing for them. 
With Savannah streaming Gail's performance live through iHeart FaceTime, Gail sings her song This Is Christmas. Gail's performance ends with a standing ovation from the crowd. Savannah runs up the stage. The live stream is blowing up with 1.9 million views. One year later, Gail's music has been hitting US Pop's Top 40. She's turned Parker's old studio into a new recording studio for herself. She's happy and teaching music to middle schooler at Harmony Springs. She finally has a place to call home.